Hello everyone, welcome to Handmade Hero Show. We code a complete game live on stream. Uh, last weekend we put in some stuff to check to see if any art asset files had changed. And if they had changed, to go through them and load them into our uh, game using the PNG reader and pull out the basically parts of the asset based on the grid system that we had set up. Uh, we stopped there. And we don't really know exactly what we're going to do for tags because now that we have like specifically laid out art assets the way the artist wants them, uh, we may want to sort of update how we're doing our tag system to better align with uh, that, right? To, we, we may want to tweak that. In fact, I'm almost certain we do. Uh, but doing that's going to require us to think it through a little bit better. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of on a little bit of a journey in that sense. Uh, where we're going to have to kind of figure out what we want to do there because I'm not really sure and we'll kind of have to see as we go. It's our first time really looking at these assets. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to be starting down today. Uh, essentially what we have to do is actually put these art assets now to use. Uh, and putting these art assets to use means being able to start tagging them and other things like this. Uh, and so that's why it's kind of going to force the issue. Like we can't really even do um, a simple version uh, of what we want to do here because in order to put the art assets into the game at all just after we load the bitmaps the thing that will allow them to be used is to tag them with something so probably what we're going to have to do first is just make something that syn synthetically uses our existing tag system to tag these assets with something that can be looked up uh, and then from there hopefully we will have gained the insight necessary uh, to make a simplified system that just accommodates exactly the kind of assets we have and can probably speed up uh, the way we're doing tags right now. We're doing tags pretty sloppy right now because we just have an anything goes arbitrary sort of vector matching system and it looks like the assets we get don't really need something like that. Um, so we can take this opportunity to actually take a step back from the tag system we had and just probably remove some of the stuff from it which will make it faster, it's simpler, easier to use, uh, all good things. Um, so hopefully that's clear. If it's not clear, we'll just stick with what we got till it does become clear uh, because we don't want to make any changes to our system if we don't really know what we're doing, right? That's no good. So we want to actually get a clear signal first, uh, a clear idea that we, we actually have something specific that would make an improvement. Until I actually get that sense, I'm not going to touch it, uh, but that's certainly what I'm looking towards and I'm hoping uh, that's where we would get after we play around with it for a little while. Uh, and, and sort of understand our art assets a little bit better. So what we can see here is where we left off is this check for art changes concept. Uh, this is basically something we can wire up in one of two ways. Uh, right now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wire it up to a key. Uh, so we push it and it updates the art. Uh, in the future, we could use directory change notification or just a timer to check periodically, things like that. Um, so we have a lot of options for how we can actually trigger the check for art changes, but that's sort of a separate issue. We don't really care about that. It's not very relevant. They're all totally fine solutions. Uh, some have like maybe a little bit better than others, but any of them will work fine. The important thing that we have to get to is just what happens once it triggers. Uh, because just let's say hitting a key right now will do it. Um, and then we have to worry about, okay, so when you actually know that, there, that the user or the file system has indicated that it's time to look and see what changed, what do we actually do? So just to recap, uh, what we did there was we said, all right, when we do check for our changes, we're going to ask the platform layer to give us all the PNGs uh, that reside in the, the art asset input directory. Uh, we're just going to loop through those and we're going to ask you uh, to, to basically take the... Um, uh, take the file name, hash it so we can look up and see if we've got an existing version of it, and also split it into some pieces. And this is relevant. Uh, we did this sort of proactively because, again, we know we're going to have to do something with that. Uh, those pieces are separated by underscores, and that's what we're going to have to use now because, remember, the PNG, the artists don't have any idea how to mark those up, right? Uh, you, you know, in Photoshop, you can go in and enter text and stuff that will come out in the PNG and things like that. We could have our artists do stuff like that. It's just, it's not something that artists generally do and it's putting an extra onus on them to deal with that. And so I'd rather just not. So instead what we'd like to do is just use a file name. Artists understand file names, they work with them every day. So if you could just tell them, okay, the file name should look like this, that's much easier for them to verify and work with than use some obscure text annotation tool in Photoshop that you've never used before, right? 
Uh, so you want to try and keep things simple in that sense. And so we've tried to do that. Uh, but what that means is we have to parse the file name specifically, not the concept of the file, to tell us what this actually is. So we get an, a bitmap, that's great, it's got the information, it's got the stuff that the artist drew, but what it doesn't tell us is what that stuff pertains to, right? We just get a bunch of images, okay, here's a character or something, right? How do we know if it's the hero or one of the other orphans from the orphanage, or is it a monster like a snake or something that's supposed to attack you? You know, all of those things all we get is a sprite sheet. That's, that's all we have. So the file name is the thing that's going to allow us to do that. And so what we have to do is we have to work from a file name forwards to get the tags that should uh, uh, be there for each individual asset. So that's what's going to start to come into play today and tomorrow. So that's very important. Um, right now, it's just thrown away. So right now, we just we parse it, but we don't use it. So we're going to be putting that into use, that parsed file name uh, separated by the underscores there. Uh, but right now we're not doing that. So that's the, that's something we're going to be doing. So then what we did, uh, is we look to see if we have, uh, the file in question already processed. If we do, um, then we know that we've sort of mashed an existing asset and have to update it. If we haven't, then what we do is we, we, um, uh, create a new sort of storage thing that says, okay, here is a new art asset we've not seen before, right? Um, so that's how that goes. So uh, while we're doing this, there's one thing we didn't handle here. And I'm not sure exactly how we would want to handle it. Uh, it's kind of a tough question to answer. What will happen if we don't make any changes to how this is working right now? Is if you deleted an Arn asset file, the assets would still remain in the pack file until you rebuilt it fresh, right? So let's say that you created 10 sprite sheets for 10 monsters, um, monsters one through 10. If you then deleted monster seven sprite sheet, it wouldn't matter. You could still use monster seven all day long uh, in the game because it would still be in the pack file because it had been imported and it would just be, there would be no indication that it was gone. There are reasons to and not to do that, but even if we say that we want to continue doing that, what we will probably want to do, and I'll put a to do in here because I don't think we put one in here for it yet. What we will probably want to do is at least warn the artist and or programmer that that has occurred. So if they delete Monster 7, we should probably warn them, hey, Monster 7 is still available in the pack files. You deleted Monster 7. You should just be aware of that fact. Like, we should probably put a thing that says, like, if and if maybe if someone in the game uses that sprite, maybe it should be marked as such. Like, maybe we should put a purple outline around it. Um, or something like that because probably you never want the game to get into a state that you've deleted the source pings but you're still using them effectively because that's like almost an error state like it's even though the game can still go if you you probably always want to be in a position to rebuild your assets from scratch you don't want to be in a situation where the pack file on a particular machine is holding the only copy of the art assets right? Like that's not really where we want to be. Uh, so I do think we probably want to do that, uh, you know, something in here where we can say like, do a sweep mark uh, to set all assets to unseen, uh, then mark each one we see so we can detect when files have been deleted because if you think about what's going on one of the props so this is sort of a meta comment that I'll make it's true about file systems in general so one of the core mistakes that was made in the design of most modern file systems is that deleted files are no longer present so this is a really crucial uh, in my opinion mistake and it's not how file systems should work so in my opinion the way file systems should work is deleted files should still show up as deleted. That's just, 
I mean, that's just how they should work. So for example, if you have a directory and you have a.txt, b.txt, c.txt, and d.txt, right? If you delete c.txt, what you should see if you do a directory of that is you should see c.txt parentheses deleted. Now that may sound like a weird thing. Why is he saying that? Why is he saying it's an obvious mistake uh, that file systems do this rather than just a preference thing? The reason is because deletion is an act. It, it is a thing that the user actually did. And by removing any trace of the fact that they've done it, it becomes impossible for you to properly synchronize directories. You can no longer tell the difference between a directory that had A, B, C, D, and then had C removed, than one that just had A, B, and D and never had a C in the first place. What this means is that backup utilities, file synchronization utilities, networking utilities, all of these things now have to keep backing stores to determine whether or not you deleted files. And when it comes to a situation where you have deleted files, it only really knows since its last snapshot. It doesn't really even know if maybe there was a file there and then you deleted that file, which is information it can't get if it didn't take a snapshot in between the, the creation and the deletion, right? So uh, a lot of modern file systems make this mistake. There's attempts to add it back in. So I think like Windows Volume Shadow Copy Service I think understands this now. Um, so I, I, I don't quote me on this, but I believe that modern file systems now have a little more of this getting added back in, but it was kind of like a huge dark period where we didn't have it. And so now it still doesn't really exist in the file APIs and even accessing that becomes difficult and blah, blah, blah. What we are seeing here is just a tip of an iceberg of a mistake in a design of the general way we consider file systems to work. And here it is. Rather than getting the obvious thing we want, which is a listing of all of the file names that have existed in this directory and which ones still exist, instead we're getting something quite a bit worse than that, which is just a list of the files that exist currently. You can take this one step further and understand the fact that really you should have a change grid with every file name. So every file name, rather than saying what the last write time is, not particularly relevant, what you need is the last change index. And every time that the file is updated, you can create the change index, right? Again, that would allow us to see whether these files were the same or different um, and if we missed changes in between, right? So at least this would say, oh, the last time you looked, it was change number 32. Now it's change 40. Oh, someone made eight different changes that we didn't get to see, right? Again, information. So a lot of this information gets lost uh, and modern file systems just do a bad job with it. They are starting to add these things back in, um, you know, like the old VMS file system actually understood versions. When you change a file, you could see the old versions of the file automatically, stuff like this. Um, so there were, people understood better in the old days what file systems might be capable of. We got rid of a lot of that in personal computing and maybe it'll get added back in. But this is just one very small, very simple example of how that manifests itself in making it harder to make tools that work with files. Again, very, very basic. There's a lot more we could say about it, but hopefully that gives you some perspective on why the basic file operations that were exposed with say FAT32 um, and things like that are just, are just not very good, right? They're, they're not the core set you would want. Uh, and a lot of people don't know any better, so they think that that's just what a file system is, but it shouldn't be, it should be more than that. Uh, and you know, hopefully someday we'll kind of claw our way back to there uh, because this is not news. I'm not saying things that are revolutionary. I'm saying things that are, if anything, retroactive. They're saying, hey, can we get back some of the technology we had in the 1970s uh, and which went away in the personal computing era and which now you know, is kind of, uh, Hope, go, going to hopefully come back, uh, hopefully. Uh, I say that with a big hopefully because yeah, who, who knows. All right, uh, so anyway, so we wanna do something like that eventually probably. Right now, that's the least of our concerns. The tags are gonna be the bigger problem. So we don't really have to care about that too much. That's sort of a minutia point, a nice to have if you will. Uh, so what we're really looking at here is the, the core stuff here. Once we get one of these things in and we see that we it's out of date, 
And remember, this will work correctly um, when we've never seen the thing before because the file date will just get initialized to zero. So that's, that will never be a valid file date that comes through. So we will automatically trigger this case either if the file has actually had a write update done to it so that the file date is changed from the old file date or we will trigger if the file date was zero here, right? Because then this will never be able to be matched. So it'll, it'll definitely enter this. Once we get in there, we're gonna make a temporary arena uh, and do a bunch of processing and then throw that away. Uh, so what you can see here is us going ahead and reading all of the information out of the file, just sucking the whole thing into memory because we know all our PNGs are not so big that they can't fit in the memory of the machine, certainly. Uh, so then we run the update uh, asset manager from PNG. Uh, and you can see that right here. And that is the part that we really have to work on. Uh, we call out to process tiled import. The reason for that is we're probably gonna wanna expand this uh, very shortly to work on non-tiled imports uh, for uh, title screen, stuff like that. We already actually do have something we can test with that. Um, oops, that's the wrong directory. Uh, in our art import directory, we've got this little title screen here that we can pop up. So this example of just what we could put like, you know, on the press start page or whatever, that is not tiled. Uh, so we would like to have a way of indicating that we're gonna import a non-tiled image that will not go through this, right? Uh, but here's the, the main course of action, process tiled import. As you can see, we go through process tiled import. Uh, what we do is we break the file up into those tiles. Remember, again, the tiles uh, is how we've organized things into sprite sheets. Uh, what we wanna do is check each tile to see if there's anything in it, because a lot of them will be blank. Uh, and what you can see here is when we, uh, when we do the min max here for any given tile, that's actually gonna tell us sort of the bounds of that tile. And when we know the bounds of the tile, we can then know whether there's anything in it. Because if we never expand the bounds at all, then we know that um, there's just nothing in that tile. So coming through here, you can see us doing those, uh, those operations, right? Figuring out whether there's anything in here. Once we know that there is, uh, we take a look at it and we say, have we already processed this tile before, uh, like a previous version of the PNG? If so, that's our asset index. If not, we need to get a new asset index. Uh, once we come through and have an asset index, we will then say, all right, let's reserve some space to store the new data for this thing. We won't do that if the existing space for the thing would fit it, right? Which it, which it will in some cases. So uh, let's say we import a PNG and immediately after we import the same PNG again, that space we used to store it the first time, we can just use the same space again, right? Then we come through here and say, okay, uh, we, uh, we now can store it. We just need to update the data and the asset record to reflect the new size, the new information uh, that we put there. And so really, again, getting back to what I said at the very beginning of the stream, the real part that's missing here, because we got some stub functions, but they're gonna be pretty easy to implement. These are not difficult. Uh, stub functions to write. Uh, so the real work today, uh, or probably tomorrow, if we flesh this out and test it, uh, we probably will leave this, to, we'll start on this tomorrow, will be the, this will be the hard work. The hard work is gonna be figuring out what to do about the tags. Because uh, again, the tags are kind of a, a separate issue and we really don't know uh, a lot about how we're gonna do it. Uh, but what we do know is that we're probably gonna do something different from what we were doing before. Uh, before what we were doing is sort of storing into the file um, these tag sets, but really what we've, what we see when we look is that there's sort of almost two sets, two types of tags now. And this sort of starts to get at what I was saying about how I think we'll gain some insight here. Yeah. I think we'll be able to gain some insight into what's going on. What I think we're going to find is that really when we look at uh, these sprite sheets, what we'll see is that a given sprite sheet type, like a character sprite sheet, just has the same tags. I mean, they all mean the same thing. So rather than having tags for searching bitmaps, probably the bitmaps can just be in a direct lookup scheme that corresponds to whether it's a character, an item, or a block or something, right? So that can just be a hard lookup that doesn't have any tag matching. Then what will happen, I think a but a, like sort of uh, in the upper, in the part right before that, the tag matching will probably be on what you're matching, right? So, you know, we've got all these different orphans, you know what I mean? 
they could each be tagged with different tags. Like, oh, this is an orphan that has these skills, this orphan that has those skills, something like that. Picking a particular orphan or a particular monster or a particular glove or a particular hat, right? Those, those choices are probably the ones that are going to be more based on tags, right? And we may or may not, depending on how we go, want them to be fuzzy like they currently are, or maybe they'll just be hard tags. I don't know. So we'll see. But what it looks like, at least to me, is inside a particular set where you're saying this is a sprite sheet of type blah, they're all the same. Each character sprite sheet has the same meaning. Here's the left word, here's the right word, here's the attack, here's the whatever, right? And so that doesn't, it doesn't need arbitrary tagging and arbitrary tag search anymore. It's just a waste of time and storage and effort to do that. So I feel like that's the first place we're really going to be able to simplify there. Here's a cat, by the way. I would like to get the cat in the game soon. All right. So uh, that's where we're at. Let's go ahead and start by implementing the stub functions we've left for ourselves. So what you can see here is we're going to need extra room to store new assets when we find assets uh, that we don't actually have storage for yet. And so what I'd like to do there is I'd like to be able to take, let me go ahead and uh, uh, show you what I mean here on this one. So what I want to do is take this array that has our assets in it and I would like to make that array expandable. And so the way that I'm going to make it expandable is just say, look, there's a maximum as asset count, right? Uh, and when we load the game in a release setting, perhaps the maximum asset count is the same as the asset count. But uh, when you load it in a debug setting, what we'll do is we'll make the maximum asset count much larger than the actual asset count, which allows you to grow the asset tree for free um, because you won't have to do like a recopy or anything like that. Uh, now, one thing I don't know is do we snap a pointer to this anywhere? Taking a look here, it appears that we don't really do that uh, in any real way. Uh, so what that means is we should be able to grow this array as well. As long as we always refer to assets by an integer and never by a pointer um, outside of particular situations, we should be okay. And so what I'm suspecting we could do here is if we make uh, some kind of a system that would grow this array uh, in at times when we know that we've locked everything down and all the asset processing has stopped or something like that, uh, that would allow us to do this. Now, that's harder than it seems uh, because when you have multi-threaded asset loading, you have to have now some way of locking that down and preventing, like making sure that all the asset loading has completed, expand the array, and then allow the asset loading to continue, right? Um, so we need to have some kind of a semaphore there uh, in order for that to occur. However, uh, I believe, could be wrong about this, uh, but I believe we sort of already have that. Um, I believe we sort of went a little bit down that road already. Uh, and if you take a look at, uh, this, uh, what you can see here is that there's actually a lock around accessing the assets here. And so we already have sort of a notion that assets can't be referred to inside or outside of certain times. Uh, and so we kind of went a little bit down this road already. So we probably won't have to completely rethink the way we're doing things. Probably slight modifications would work. But again, for the immediate future, we actually don't have to do anything quite so complicated. What we can do instead uh, is we can just, and this would even work, period. Like we would, could just do this, um, we could accept this solution, period, right? Uh, it, it's not necessary for us to go further than this. So we might not, but I'm just saying you could if you wanted to by using some locking there. Uh, but what we can do here when we allocate the game assets is when we actually produce that asset array, 
what you can see here is we do a push assets here um, and we do it for asset count. What I'd rather do is say, all right, assets, max asset count, right, uh, is gonna be equal to however many assets we uh, think we want. Uh, and then what I can do is say, well, if we're in developer, uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, if we're in sort of a developer build, so we've got sort of this handmade internal, handmade slow, handmade with, right? If this is an internal build, so it's supposed to allow people um, to refresh their assets, right? Um, if handmade internal is set, then what we can do is say, well, okay, this is going to be something that's running on a developer machine uh, or an enthusiast uh, or whatever, right? They're running the internal build. So when we do max asset count, uh, we're going to give ourselves a headroom where we're basically saying, okay, just allocate a ton of space, additional space or something, right? I mean, you could go nuts, like just a crap ton of space. That'll never hit, right? You can update art assets all day long, that'll never hit. So what we can do there is just give us ourselves enough headroom that our array never actually has to get relocated and then we never have to really worry about that. And again, if it did, all that you'd have to do is close the game and restart it, right? Um, because then it would, again, load in however many assets you have, plus another 65K worth of asset headroom. So again, it's worth noting that sometimes the simple solution might be better here, because rather than introducing all kinds of locking schemes and relocating this array, just give yourself enough space to work with, and you're done, right? This isn't an end user operation, so it's probably fine. All right, so if we do that allocation now, we've added a lot of extra space at the headroom for internal builds. What that means is now, um, if I go, oops, that's not at all what I wanted at all. I wanted that. <clears throat> uh, if we go here to reserve asset, all that's going to do uh, is it's going to say, look, uh, we better have room for this. And we could eventually uh, actually provide a real error here. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm going to go that extra mile. Why not? Let's change reserve asset uh, to something that says we'll return a true or false, right? Uh, and I guess maybe I'll just call this asset index and keep this as result. Uh, and what I'll say is, okay, uh, if the asset count is, is such that I can provide this, uh, then I will provide it. Otherwise, I will not. So what you can see here, uh, you know what, and I suppose... Now that I think about it, uh, we actually have a zero here. So we actually don't need to do that. I could do it this way. So that would reserve a new asset. And then what I can do is go down here to reserve asset where we call it. You can see this is the only place we call it. Um, what I can do here is actually process the error, like handle the error here. Uh, and so what I can do is say if we got an asset index, do this. Otherwise, don't. So then we've actually said, oh, okay, like we, we will handle that error. Uh, and I can put in here uh, an actual out to the error processing because you can see here we've already got error reporting, so I might as well make use of it, right? I'll say, okay, uh, Uh, right? So this way, if we did set this to a relatively low number for some reason, which I don't think we should, but let's say we did, we would actually still at least get an error message here and the person could know that something had gone wrong and then try again. 
Furthermore, what we can do here when we do update asset package from ping, another thing that we can do is since we know when we have uh, errors, we could say that if there are errors, we'll try the file again, right? So for example, uh, in here where we set the file date, uh, what we could do is say, well, instead of doing that before, maybe we do it after uh, and we only do it if there were no errors. So basically if the file in question, uh, if the file in question doesn't have any errors on it when we um, when we iterate over it, then then we consider it updated. If it does have errors, we consider it not updated. So the next time it'll try again, right? Um, there's reasons to and not do to do that. Uh, let me update that slightly. Since there are in, since these errors are internal errors, we may just want to detect those specifically. So, what we would want to do here is say that the match that we got, right? You'd probably want to do something like that. I'm guessing. It's hard to say uh, if we had a lot of these. I'm trying to think, do we have any others of these? That's really the only one. All right, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. If we had a lot of ways we could internal error, I might, but we really don't. Um, so it's fine. Uh, another thing we should do is probably clear this. You know what I'm saying? We don't really have any way to clear a stream right now. Uh, and so if we want to reset it, uh, I guess I'll maybe call this reset. So before we process anything, uh, we would say, all right, reset. Uh, Reset the error stream here. Does that seem reasonable? I'm trying to think if I like that. Take it back. I don't. So I think what I would rather do is just have a way to put stuff in there, right? Uh, so what I think I'd rather do is actually just have the status be in there. So when it goes to read this thing, uh, I think I'd rather just put in a like a marker and maybe we would have some way in the future of being a little bit more specific about the fact that this was a break um, you know, something like that. So I don't know exactly, um, how that should go. I'm like kind of vacillating on it, but like, uh, basically like we want something that breaks it up so we can see older errors. I'm just going to keep them because why not? So really when we import, I'll just, I just want a thing that shows me where the last, you know, the most recent um, import began. So I know what, I know when we, you know, sort of had previous ones uh, and I won't think that those errors are part of the current import. So I don't know, something like that. I haven't really decided how I want to do that. I still also haven't decided whether I wanted to per, this, this memory, this error stream, I don't, still don't know whether I maybe want it just 
one error stream that's for the whole system. Um, so all of that's a little bit up in the air right now, but that's the current situation. All right. Uh, so what's the problem here? Um, Uh, so, okay. Anyway, moving on. This, uh, like I said, is a pretty simple function to implement, so it has been. Uh, these are slightly more complicated, the reserve data part. I'm going to skip that one because that's the one that's a, that's a little bit squinky. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, but for write asset data and write asset, these are not uh, probably very uh, complicated by comparison. Um, the, uh, the main problem that we're going to find is that we have to worry about the headers uh, and where those headers are. So again, we may have to reorganize our files a little bit uh, or allow sort of a slightly different file format or something like this. Okay, um, so as far as writing asset data is concerned, this is pretty straightforward because we already know where we're gonna write the data. So the complexity is gonna come in here where we have to actually figure out where the uh, data for this asset should go. So write asset data itself is really just going to be as simple as using the file handle that we already have uh, in, you know, stored in our, um, oops, there we go, uh, that we already have stored in our asset file structure. Uh, so this platform file handle here, all we really need to do is take that asset file uh, platform handle there. And when we do our, uh, our write, it's not called write file, is it? It's called, there it goes. Oh, we don't have one. We do now. Uh, so really all we're going to do here is just call whatever the right function is. Uh, and that function uh, is going to be an exact mirror of the read function. Uh, so it's just going to take where you wanted to put it, uh, how big it was, and what it was. And literally that's like all we're going to do, right? Uh, we, we don't have anything else we need to do there. That's, it's that simple. Uh, and the same is more or less true. Uh, for write asset, but like I said, because the assets have to get expanded, uh, this is going to be a little bit trickier for uh, what we're doing. The reason it's a little bit trickier uh, is because the, um, like if you take a look at how we've got these things stored uh, in file formats, so you can see here the way that we've got our stuff stored uh, is that we have an offset to an assets array and we've got an asset type um, and tags, these two things here. Uh, you can see what those actually are. So the asset type count, um, let's go scroll through these things here. Uh, here it is. So <clears throat> you can see sort of the way these things work. Uh, and uh, to a certain extent, again, I think reorganizing these files is going to make a lot of sense for us, right? Uh, because we can do a lot better than what we did here now that we know what we're sort of storing. Uh, but the HHA asset type itself, uh, this part here is what will cause us the problem. So assets, we can already just locate at the end of the file and grow. So we can put more assets on there and that's no big deal. Um, but the asset types, we will have a problem organizing the assets inside that asset array if they have to be contiguous. All of the assets of a particular type have to be written out contiguously for the asset type thing to work, right? Uh, so there's a lot of different ways we could attack this problem. 
and I'm not sure exactly which way we want to do it. Uh, and so we'll kind of go through it slowly. But um, regardless of what we choose, what we're going to have to be able to determine is when we want to update <clears throat> the information about an asset uh, in a file, we're going to have to figure out which file that asset is in, right? And so what we did conveniently is inside uh, the asset system itself, when we're actually talking about a particular asset, um, where is it here, right? Uh, when we're actually talking about a particular asset, we remembered what file that asset was in, right? We know that piece of information. Uh, and furthermore, we're going to store the asset index in the file as a separate piece of information, which uh, again is sort of, it, it's because we have this need to relocate where in the file it actually was. Uh, right now, we're actually not uh, tracking that. We should probably put that in before we forget, I guess. So you can see it happening here. So if we wanted to keep this piece of information, we definitely could. Uh, what's gonna happen here is the file index that we're dealing with here, right, is coming in because we're looping over the files individually. Uh, when we are looking at which asset index this is, uh, globally speaking, it's going to be um, it's going to be this asset count here minus the base asset count base it, minus the base asset index for this file. So you can see here where you know we're loading up a particular file. When we start here. Uh, we sort of need to understand what asset we're on separate from the global asset index, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how we want to store that exactly. The easiest way is probably just to go like this. Right. Um, so then in here, we can just say... like that. So we can pretty easily keep track of which asset index this was in a particular file. <coughs> but again, that's not really probably how we wanna store these now that they're being updated. So I'm guessing that this table uh, will actually, will change the way that we're storing it, right? We won't store it the way that it's being stored at the moment. Okay, um, so yeah, we've got a lot of different ways we can do this. So here's another proposal. Uh, write asset data, again, I think, and reserve data are pretty straightforward because I think they can just tack on to the end of any particular file. It doesn't really matter. Um, so uh, I'm not too worried about this function. We'll talk about that in a second. So it's really just this function that's the problem. And the reason that this function is the problem is because we have this situation uh, where again the the way the ways in which we might want to store that permanent storage uh, for looking up assets and stuff, it just isn't conducive to insertion. Um, it would require us to rewrite a bunch of stuff. There are two ways we can go about solving this problem, and I'm probably going to choose uh, the following one because I think it's just easier. We know that asset importing doesn't happen very frequently, right? Meaning it happens every time an artist changes uh, a bitmap file, but that's it. So what we could elect to do is change the way that we're currently thinking about our asset files. So take a look at what we do right now. If we look, we've got three HHA files, right? Uh, and those get loaded. Oh, and test fonts, I think, gets loaded too, right? Uh, so does interest. Okay, so we've actually got like uh, three, we got five different HHA files get loaded, right? Each of those files contains bitmap and sound data uh, and also then contains the structural information necessary to reference those bitmap and sound data, right? 
what we could do is change the meaning uh, or change the way that those HHAs work such that we have the ability to reference data in other files from a given file. What that would allow us to do is just rewrite the complete asset header every time. Right? Um, I, again, I'm not sure that that's the best option. But it's definitely an option. Another way we could do it is just to make it so that we rewrite the header every time for the current, uh, for like, we take one file and we say, okay, here's the file that you're editing. Uh, and whatever file you're editing, that's the one that gets rewritten, but it gets its header rewritten every time. In which case, this would not actually be the function. Uh, the function would be like that. That seems pretty reasonable, I would say. So I guess here's what I'll say. I think that I think I like that the best. So here's what I'm going to propose. I'm going to propose we don't actually modify anything. We just leave it exactly the way it is. What we do is well, I, I like I said, I still might want to modify the way the tags work. So that, but that's a separate discussion. It doesn't involve this. What we do is I'm just going to rewrite the entire header. So every time we rewrite a file, we just rewrite the the header of the file, uh, and and off we go. Um, the thing that I don't super love is I I feel like maybe there's one thing that we should change because it doesn't make a lot of sense and we don't really need it to be this way. Since we load the whole asset array every time, it seems like it would make more sense rather than having the asset types range stuff in here to just have it so that every asset itself stores which type it is. Just seems smarter. Because we, we loop through them when we do the merge. It made sense when we didn't do a merge. Now we do a merge, it just seems like that's smarter, right? Because if you're gonna do a merge anyway, um, you might as well uh, just store that information directly, right? Um, Yeah, so I think that's the one change that I would propose. Now, there's a couple of different ways we could do that. We can actually do that without changing this file format, really, if we wanted to, by just making the asset types array have as many entries in it as the assets itself. Um, let me take a look at how our merge works at the moment.
Yeah, I mean, that just seems a lot saner to me. I think that makes a lot more sense. So I'm going to propose that we make that change. Let me uh, do a little, uh, let me just do a little bit of uh, fancy footwork here and then we'll go do that. So I think we can do that without much effort actually. All right. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and change the, the platform write data to file part here because we didn't have one of those. So here's read data from file. Uh, here's write data to file. Uh, and again, it's like exactly the same, right? Uh, read and write is basically identical. Sometimes you implement these by just having a flag which says which one you're doing. Um, in this case, we'll just have a, another callback uh, into the platform layer, but that's the idea. Uh, in the, on the Win32 side, again, it's gonna be frighteningly simple. Uh, so read data from file. Uh, if you take a look at that function, it looks like we support 64-bit reads. Uh, so yeah, so here's a 64, oops, uh, bit write data, I guess as well, we could do same thing. Um, and again, what you can see here is it's really just, we would if we just call write file instead of read file, it should be basically the same, right? It should be basically the same. Uh, so this is just bytes written. Now instead of bytes read, uh, and instead of a dest, we have a source. But other than that, it'll be exactly the same. Uh, that's really all there is to it. There we go. I don't know why that's called source. Should be called handle, but okay. It's platform write data to file, correct? Oops, not quite. There we go. Uh, and in the Win32 layer, this should be handle here. Oops. There we go. Um, that looks better. Uh, okay. Not sure why, oh, because this is right data. That should do it. So now we have a platform write. It's exactly the same as the read, so no real big difference there. Um, we, let's see, cannot convert. Platform file handle. So I guess we just need the address of it, but other than that, we're fine. Yeah. Uh, so writing asset data, is pretty straightforward now. Reserving asset data will also be pretty straightforward and rewriting the header should be pretty straightforward too. So a lot of this stuff is now gonna be uh, a lot uh, simpler. But write asset is now no, no longer what would happen. Uh, in fact, we now no longer have to do that at the end of each thing. Instead of what we're gonna do is after the entire thing happened, uh, it's, it's right here, right? So after everything happens, then what we're gonna to wanna to do is only right here actually do uh, the, the write of the file. So right in here, we need a, um, uh, you know, write HHA header or rewrite, right? So we're gonna have to work on that in a second. Uh, but that's basically all I think we would need to do, assuming that we make a little bit of a change uh, to how we're conceptualizing, and this, this goes away now, uh, how we're conceptualizing uh, that asset import. So what I wanna do uh, from the moment, um, I wanna comment this out. I wanna run the game and make sure it's fine. 
Uh, and then what I want to do is make a slight change to how we're storing those pieces of information. And I'll do it in a way that still reads the old files because it's, I don't think it's very hard for, pfft, that's good. Um, I was working on some old witness walk map stuff. I don't think we want to run that, or maybe we do. That's probably uh, something we could run, I guess. Uh, spoiler warning, I'm going to be giving a talk on the witnesses uh, walk manifold stuff that I did. Um, and uh, so I, I uh, wanted to also make some changes that I never got a chance to make during the actual development. So I, uh, I was playing around with it again. Uh, so anyway, what I want to do is make sure I can reload uh, the... Uh, I want to make sure I can reload the game uh, and have all the HHA still work. And so what I want to do here is look at that file format. Oops. Uh, what I want to do here is look at the file format and see how I can send it to do the thing that I wanted it to do. So. Right now, the problem that I have with the file format, right, is that this stuff is, uh, it, it's, it's very confusing, right, to see how the asset types and the assets are lined up, right? You have to read the asset array, then read the asset types array, and use the contiguous regions of assets to, uh, to get their types. What I would rather be able to do is just have every asset have a, its type included in it, right? Now, that is not necessarily directly possible uh, without changing the file format a little bit because the assets currently don't uh, store a type in that way. So if you take a look at what an HHH as HHA asset has in it, it doesn't have a type. So it may seem like there isn't room to put that in there and we'd have to expand the data set to the file format, right? But I would argue we don't really have to do that because what we can do instead is have this asset types array here. We can just change the meaning of the asset types array to actually have the same number uh, as assets and tell us what the type of each asset is, right? Um, that just works. So what we can do, although it's a little bit piggy, is we can actually just output uh, this array in a different way. Um, in fact, I guess we can just, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can literally just output one of these for every asset that just has first asset index, the asset index, one pass last asset index, the first asset is plus one with a type. So we can then optimize an HHA header for loading by sorting all the assets by their type ID, but we don't have to. So now that I think about it, we actually don't have to do anything. I think that just works. So let's take a look in memory here. I think this is actually just gonna just work. In memory, we don't do that anymore. Do we? Oh, we do, so we do here, right? So really the only thing that's gonna have to happen is change is this part here uh, because this part won't quite work anymore because the assets won't be compact in that way. So let's just take a look at that part. I think that's really all we're gonna have to modify. So when you when we do get, get best match asset from, you can see what it does is it's gonna look through um, the asset types here. I mean, we could just make that a chain, right? We could just make that in a, a, a linked list or something and we'd be done, you know? Um, And, and that's exactly the part that we're going to want to upgrade with the tags, with the matching anyway. So it's like, I, 
I feel like this part is something that I don't really care about right now because it's going to modify it anyway. But let's just say, for sake of argument, uh, that I change it to something like this just to maintain the current way that things are working. Uh, now in here, what I would do is say, oh, uh, yeah, you don't do that, right? Um, instead, what you do is you just kind of like loop over these things. And I, what, how does acid index work here? Yeah, so, so all I really need to do is, um, is chain these assets together. And of course, I would need to know uh, as well for each individual asset, I need to know um, yeah, kind of like how, what its asset index was globally. So, you know, th this gets a little piggier here if I actually want to uh, keep that piece of information. So I think I think what I may do is just do that. Uh, when we do asset types here, uh, I will say, okay, the asset index is just assets, first asset of whatever, uh, oops, uh, whatever the type is that you ask for. Um, I could actually do this as well. You know what, that's what I'll do. Makes it even easier. Uh, so for right now, what I'll say is, all right, so we've got an asset index. Uh, that asset index is gonna be the first asset for that type ID, right, and it comes back. Uh, and then uh, when I, as I move through there, uh, and, and this is going to have to be uh, written sort of slightly differently, right? It's going to have to be uh, written, I guess, like this. So what I'll do is I'll just say, all right, we're going to, we'll chain through these, uh, and look for assets of this particular type as we walk through them. Uh, we'll do the standard tag match we were doing before. Again, this whole routine will probably just change, uh, but I just want to maintain the current behavior for now. Uh, so we'll go through those and we can look through them as a list so they don't have to be contiguous anymore inside the asset array, which allows us to update assets in a non-contiguous fashion. Um, and I think that's probably sufficient. So then instead of having to build these arrays, uh, which, you know, what are we talking about here? What did I, I didn't, ah, there we go. I'll change that to that. Uh, now what I'm gonna do is say, okay, let's, uh, Yeah, so this one's a little bit harder because this, this one, for doing random assets, it still has to do a walk through. Uh, again, not really the end of the world. Um, do we use this? I'm just curious. We do not. So I'm gonna nerf that for now. This one's pretty straightforward because this one is already, it's already set up to do that. So 
So this will just give us the answer that we want directly. And so all we really need to do now is this, right? Uh, so we need to chain these things together uh, in some way. So what we want to do is when we get one of these asset types out here, um, what I want to do is just use this as a chain. Uh, so let me go ahead and look at how this is currently happening. So basically we're loading all these, right? And we, yeah, so every time we, as we load these in, uh, really all we're doing here is as we load in all the assets, we just were putting them contiguous. We no longer have to do that. So actually this is not necessary. Uh, to do this way anymore, really, if we don't want to. Um, we can just do that up here, actually. And so the really the only thing that we, yeah, like this, this actually, storing them that way would simplify this as well. Uh, so like here where we do, where we loop through the files, um, We, we could just do it right inside inside that, right? We, we don't need to do this part again. Um, so we could really simplify this loader as well, I think, quite a bit uh, if we wanted to. We'll get, you know, a lot of things we could improve here. Anyway, so going over the files uh, this way, which is, again, dumb. The only reason this is structured this way is because we want those... Um, we were trying to keep ranges contiguous. That's the only point to this at all. Um, otherwise, you can flip these two, right, and go by file. Uh, in fact, I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna start. I'm just gonna start. I'm just gonna start doing it. Uh, so if we go th uh, through each file here, and then uh, ignore this bit entirely. Like so, if we loop over the files, uh, and then for each file, we loop over the source asset types and just get rid of this interior match, right? This was an N squared loop, essentially, that was doing inter an interior match. Just forget that. And instead, now we can actually make this routine more efficient because, you know, because we're not creating packed arrays, which we're more efficient to look up in. So, you know, it's it's a trade-off, but once you make that other trade-off, it's now free in here to just go through the source uh, asset types and now just thread them directly. So when we come through here, we don't need to track a lot of the old stuff that we were tracking before. Uh, it's simply not necessary anymore uh, for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, off you go. Uh, so when we come through here, we read out the source index uh, stuff here. Uh, we go ahead and produce the asset count type. Uh, we load the array of assets. Uh, we then loop through each individual asset. And we yeah, put the tags in. And so all we would have to do here is when we produce the global asset index, we just need to thread it now. So if you look at the first asset of type bit, um, all we have to do is say, okay, the asset, it's next of type is going to be whatever the first asset of type um, was for that asset type, which is whatever we whatever it said it was up here. Right? So whatever it said, that's what we grab. Um, and then we set that one equal to us. So standard singly linked list, right? So now we just have list an asset list that allows us to sort of say, okay, that's, you know, uh, that's the asset. Um, I have an itchy eye, probably because it's boiling hot in allergy season here. 
It's very, although I shouldn't say boiling hot because it's it's actually not compared to other parts of the country. Seattle is actually apparently fairly cool by comparison. At least that's what I'm told. Uh, so now when we load those things, we have a different method of storing them. But what that means is now they can be interleaved in any way we want. And they don't have to be contiguous in the file. And you can have different ones in the file if you want to and blah, 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 right? The only thing that we do have to do is make sure that our first, our, uh, this thing has to be zeroed, right? Um, so the question is, is it zeroed? And really that just boils down to when we push uh, bootstrap this guy, uh, is it getting cleared or not? And I think it is, right? Um, you can see in the source file hash here, we never cleared the source file hash. So we're just counting on that to be zeroed anyway. Uh, so the question is, did I mess anything up there? Probably the answer is yes. Uh, and we can see, all right, shockingly, the answer was no. Um, you know, what are the odds? Uh, still everything works just fine. Um, so anyway, that's all good. Everyone's fine with that and everything's happy and bouncing around in joy land. So once that's the case, now we have the ability to rewrite uh, our HHA file anytime we want, and we can interleave the asset types any way we want as well. It's not efficient anymore. It would be better if we just included them in each individual asset. So that's a little unfortunate, and it's something we probably should fix in the file format eventually. Uh, I'll make a note of it, but we don't really have to fix it right now. So we can maybe look towards an optimization path sometime in the future to play with that. And it's not a lot of reason to fix it at this time. So getting rid of the asset types array eventually and just storing that data directly in the assets would definitely be an improvement. So we also have another kind of uh, a little bit uh, confusing situation here, but it's not really that bad. Uh, the thing that we have that's a little bit annoying is we don't really have a way of saying what's primal for a particular asset. We just have matching tags. Uh, eventually, we'll probably have to have a thing which goes and zeroes out some of the asset stuff in other HHA files as we replace them. I don't know how much we care about that exactly, but, you know, um, it's worth noting. So anyway, that's the only change I think we have to make. So now what we need to do is we need to make a way to actually store this stuff out. Uh, and so what I want to do here is, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of change... Uh, a little bit how this is working uh, for the asset index and file file index stuff here, right? So for a file index, I'm just going to now say that that uh, we're, we're going to require for a given asset file, uh, we're going to require that it's it's marked as editable. Um, I think that's just I think that's probably the right thing to do. Like. I'm, I'm torn. I, I don't really know like which one we should do, uh, but I feel like we want to kind of say that that there's one asset file that's editable and the rest aren't. So like you're editing a particular file and like it won't go like changing the contents of other HHAs. It'll only append to that one that you said you were editing. Um, that to me kind of sounds like the right thing to do. Uh, I don't have a lot of explanation for that. I just, it feels a little weird. If uh, the, the reason that I'm just not sure what else to do about that is because when someone goes to create or do an import, right? There's no way for the game to know which HHA file you want to put that in, right? There, it's just a PNG that it's importing. The game doesn't know where you might want that. So it's going to have to pick something. If we don't make there just be a rule that when you start up, you basically say, here's an editable HHA file, 
that you then specify like, hey, anything I import during this process, put it in this HHA file or whatever. If we don't have that concept, uh, then we're sort of in a situation where we can't, where it's just always ambiguous. Like it's, you, it's never gonna know what HHA file you were actually trying to edit and it doesn't have any way to know what to put in it. Cause like if you have five HHA files in on the drive, it could put it in any of them, right? It, there's no right or wrong answer to what HHA file to put a new import in that it's never seen before, right? Uh, so I think we probably wanna say that there is uh, some kind of a pointer here that's like, hey, um, you know, uh, or an index um, like that. And so when you reserve space, you're reserving space in that specific file uh, and if that's not set to something valid, then it just doesn't allow you to edit. It's just an error, right? I think that's what I wanna do. Um, I, th I, th I, th I don't know, I think that's the right, I think that's the right solution. So that's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say there's an editing HHA concept uh, here. If, if we go into the actual uh, game layer here, you can see we set the file count uh, like so, right? Uh, one of the things that we typically have done is, you know, we set the file indexes such that file index zero is, is a null file, right? That's what we, we didn't do that here, but that's like, we did that for assets, for example. You notice the asset <clears throat> count precedes uh, to one. So I kind of feel like maybe we do that with the files as well. Just leave a null file in there. That way you can say stuff uh, about uh, the file index being set uh, to nothing, for example. I feel like that's a good idea. So, you know, if I did that, something like this, uh, I feel like that's probably a good idea. And later when we loop through these things, uh, I could just say, look, you start um, with file index one. It's also true that now we can merge uh, this stuff. So, um, you know, there's really no reason that we can't just do the tag read here. Right, uh, <clears throat> that doesn't have to happen anymore. <clears throat> Seems reasonable. Okay, uh, so moving on. So this editing HHA index, right? That's gonna be set to zero by default. And that means that there is no uh, HHA available for editing. So if I were to run here, um, oops. This shouldn't be that, it should be this. <clears throat> uh, yeah, and so I th think that's right now. Just off, because the, um, yeah, the file counter is only for us, not for the platform layer anymore. Uh, so what I want to do now is just say, all right, we have the concept that there's a HHA that we're using for editing, uh, and that's, you know, uh, a special case. And what I want to do is make it so that now this routine is always aware, like that's always where that goes. So for example, when we do check for our changes, um, <clears throat> if, uh, 
if we're going to go through this process here, then what I want to do is make sure that we don't actually ever entertain that notion uh, if we're not in a mode where we can actually edit something, right? Uh, so what I want to do here is say, yeah, don't even start this process if you can't possibly finish it, right? Um, so I call that again, editing HHA. So like if there isn't an HHA that we're actually actively editing at this time, then that's uh, like just, that's just a straight up error, right? That's like not um, something that we want to uh, allow. We could print out a message here eventually. I don't know how we're gonna do that exactly, but something like that. So there has to be one of these once we know there's one of those, we go through it. Then at the end, we'll rewrite it. So here now what we would say is, if we made changes, uh, rewrite HHA directory or whatever, right? Uh, and rewriting the HHA directory, we know it, the one in question is the HHA index. Uh, and off we go. Um, I could, I guess, also do it this way. Uh, like so, uh, where that HHA will now get uh, rewritten. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Uh, so that's the function that we're going to have to write, and it's relatively complex, so that, that one will be a little bit of work, right? But we already did one of them inside the simple asset processor, so we can probably just import the code from that, uh, and it shouldn't be too big of a stretch, right? Hopefully. This is called asset file. Um, so we have to be able to rewrite that directory. So the two functions that we're now missing are these two. Uh, and fortunately for us, they're not particularly complicated. Uh, when we do a reserve asset now, and we, uh, we get sort of a new asset out of the file, we want to clear that asset if it's not already cleared uh, and set it to stuff, right, which we're going to do up here we need to set the file equal to whatever the editing file is, right? Um, so when we come through here and we say, you know, uh, here's the asset in question, uh, we need to set which file that is when we reserve the file. So, you know, in here we say like, okay, uh, whatever the file index is, we probably just want to remap it. Like we want to move it to a different file at that point. Um, the file that's being edited if we're changing this asset. And I'm not sure. Yeah, again, like I said, I'm not sure if we want to allow editing of assets in, in a different file than the one that we have open for editing. Uh, I mean, probably we don't, right? Like probably we want to do a thing here where we would say, look, if this asset isn't in the file that you said you wanted to edit, then we're not going to let you edit it, right? Um, so as I push down a little further, I don't like that, I'll be honest. So maybe, maybe what I said before just isn't the right thing. Maybe we want you to have as many files for editing as you want. So maybe this is really not editing HHA index. It's really just like you have to say which file new stuff goes into, but if you want to, you can still edit old files. Um, like that. So it's like, all right, if 
we know where this asset goes, we'll put it in that file. If we don't know where it goes, it goes in this default HHA, right, or something. Uh, it sounds a little janky to me, but like I said, I don't know what to do about it because maybe you have, I mean, like, just thinking it through to its logical conclusion, suppose an, an, an uh, artist is working on updating some files, there's like two HHAs, one for like something and one for an expansion, and they just want to edit the art for both at the same time. I mean, there's no reason they can't. So like, why force them to close and restart the game just to switch which one they're editing? Like, why not let them edit both at the same time? I, I right? So, I don't know. Seems plausible. Uh, so in here where we do the reserve asset, um, when we assign a new asset, then what we'd say is like, okay, that asset goes in the default appending file, right? Uh, so it just says, um, also this is now lo no longer a thing, I guess. Uh, so we can just say if asset asset or sorry file index equals zero asset file index uh, equals assets uh, default append hha index um, and then off we go so then we have the asset files here uh, which um, we'll now grab one of those files out. Here we could assert that this is non-zero. Uh, we may have to reserve data in this particular asset file for the asset uh, to save if we need to. That's all fine. So I think that's all pretty reasonable. So then what we need to do inside the asset file here is we also need some way of remembering what the high watermark was uh, of this particular file that we're editing. So uh, we would need here like a U64 that's like file size, right? But once we have that, then we're pretty much done with that part of the process. And uh, the way that we're gonna do this is gonna be pretty, uh, interesting. So, so bear with me here. This is a, sort of a compact file. I don't want to call it a trick, just something that we can use to make our lives easier. Let's say. Oops. So what do we have right now? What's the problem that we have right now? Well, we've got an array uh, of asset information. And, and you know, it kind of looks like this, right? It's got like, here's asset zero and one and two and three. Well, we don't actually talk about them that way. We talk about them with other numbers, but you get the idea. There's assets in here, right? Uh, then we also have another thing, which is just like arbitrarily sized data. That's like bitmaps for these assets or whatever, right? or sound data or whatever it is. And these assets store in them an offset that says like where that stuff is. Oops. But we have a problem. These two things appear sequentially in a file, right? So let's say we stack them together. Then what happens is only one of them can grow, right? Let's say we put the assets first and the bitmaps second. Well, that's all fine and dandy because now when we get a new bitmap in, we can just stick it on the end and that works great. Uh, and if it happens to revert to an existing asset, that's just fine because we can just use the offset in here to point to it, right? But the problem is what happens if we need to add a new asset record? It's gonna overwrite some of our bitmap data and that's no good, right? 
Same token, if we put the bitmaps first, uh, and then we've got the asset array afterwards, well, now we have the opposite problem. It's free to add assets on, and as long as they refer to existing bitmap data, we're fine. But as soon as we need to add new bitmap data, we would overwrite some of our asset data. So what do we do, right? Are we just, are we screwed? Uh, the answer is to understand the relative size between these two things, right? This is huge. This is tiny. How many assets might we have in this game? 5,000? 10,000? How many is Anna realistically going to be able to draw? It's not going to be 100,000. She would, her arm would fall off, right? So if you think about the size of these things, uh, let's just do a simple back of the envelope compu uh, computation. Let's say she draws 10,000 assets. And let's say that each asset is actually like, you know, 256 bytes or something like this, right? That's two and a half megabytes of data. A modern hard drive writes two and a half megabytes of data before you can even say the words two and a half megabytes of data. Bitmaps, on the other hand, are 1024 by 1024 by four for one of them. One of them. That's four megabytes large if we don't compress them. We might, but the starting, that's the worst case, right? If you got no compression on them, that's what you'd get. So even just getting, you know, th th then they'll never be 256 bytes, no matter how well we compress them, right? Best case scenario, we get like eight to one, 16 to one or something on them. Let's say they're all super cartoony and hardly any shading, we get 60 to one, right? Even 60 to 1 compression, it's nowhere near the size of one of these. Even if each one of these was a full K long, it's still nowhere near it, right? It's a full 64K just for one compressed bitmap if we were very lucky, right? So what that means is we can assume that this is massive, this is tiny. If it's tiny, what does that mean? It's free to rewrite it, right? It's free. Writing 2.5 megabytes used to be a big deal. It's nothing now. An artist machine can rewrite 2.5 megabytes before Photoshop can even select the lasso tool. Not counting if you accidentally, heaven for fend, accidentally hit the open in bridge button, at which point you could rewrite all of the world's knowledge many times over to optical media and you would be done before Photoshop could even open its dialog box, right? So writing that 2.5 megabytes, 10 megabytes, however much it is, is basically free. So what do we do? We treat that as, a, as sort of a rewritable section that we just move to the bottom of the file every time. So every time we import, right, what we actually do is we've got a file that looks like this, assets at the end, bitmaps at the beginning, right? We overwrite the asset array with new bitmap data, it's gone now. Then we rewrite the asset array onto the end. Easy peasy, right? So what that means is that actually what we do here, and I know it's a little weird, is we don't really store the file size, so I need to talk about it now because I need to start explaining what this actually is, right? We need to call this the high watermark, basically, right? And what that is is it's saying, look, there is other stuff in this file, like the asset array but we already read it into memory. Like we've got it. So now what we're gonna do is if we need to add to this file, we're gonna obliterate that part of the file. We're gonna overwrite it with bitmap data. And then we're gonna slap onto the end a new version of the stuff we just obliterated because hey, by the way, it's different now anyway. Make sense? So this is a pretty simple way 
to split up your files uh, and not really have to worry about that fact. Another way you could do it is split them into two different files, uh, but we don't really have the need to do that, right? This keeps them more concise uh, and it's pretty much free to do. Like I said, the size of those um, additional pieces of array information are just so small that it really doesn't matter. Uh, so. so all we have to do here is go, hey, there's a header in the file. It's got an offset to the assets and the asset types. We will just relocate those to the end of the file every time and rewrite the header. And we're done. Right? Uh, so once we understand that fact, what we have to do is do a little bit of work to determine where that high watermark actually is. Uh, and so for the moment, we will sort of have a little bit of jankiness because we didn't design the file system to do this uh, because we didn't think we were ever going to actually allow rewritable files. Uh, so the as a result, we don't have a high watermark stored in the file, which is what we would have wanted. So we would have wanted to write that in here. So determining the high watermark is actually a little bit of a dance that we would have to do uh, to determine whether or not the asset array actually appears at the end or not. If it does, we can use it. If it doesn't, we can't. It's no big deal either way, but that's the, that's the current setup, right? Uh, so that's what we'll do, and we'll go from there. Uh, so, yeah, it's, like I said, pretty straightforward, but that's just the understanding that you have to have going into it. All right, so to start with, we can make this easy and we can just like lose space in our asset files that we don't really, we shouldn't really lose, um, but we can by just always setting the high watermark to the actual file size. But then what we can do is we can do better than that um, later on by setting the high, oops, by setting the high watermark uh, to actually be our our file size minus any arrays that, we that we're gonna rewrite that we detect to be at the end. Uh, so coming through here, uh, what we wanna do is when we load in these files, so right about here, uh, where we start to load in these files, what we wanna do is let's remember, like you can see we open the file here, right? And we read some data out of it, that's the header, right? Uh, what we wanna do here is store the header so that we always know what the header, header is. Thankfully, we did exactly that, right? We, we get that information. Uh, then what we want to do is store what the, what the platform tells us the size of that file is. Uh, so we want to be able to set the high watermark here, like so. Uh, and the file info structure can tell us that. So remember in the file infra stress, uh, infrastructure here, we've got this file size. That tells us how big that thing is. Uh, so we can just set the high watermark to that and know we can always write past it. But we can do a little bit better. Uh, we can say if uh, at end of file, something like this, uh, if a particular array is at the end of the file, then we can just back up. Uh, here, right here. Uh, so we've got three arrays, tags, asset types, and assets, right? Uh, and we can rewrite them all if we want to. Uh, so what we wanna do is say, all right, if the file header tags array Uh, which by the way is this long, right? If that's at the end of the file, then we wanna back up by that amount. Uh, and so I'm gonna make sort of a thing here that's like back up uh, watermark or you know retract watermark, something like that. And say, look, take this, this is the file. The high watermark is at the end of the file by default. For each array in the file, just look to see uh, if it's actually at the end. 
right? If it is at the end, back it up. This may look weird, but I'm going to loop on that. And what I'm going to do is say, look, why did that not line up? Do I have like one too many of those or something? There we go. I must have had one too many of those. I'm going to say, all right, if uh, we have done um, any of those, I actually want the inverse of it. So I really want to say, if none of these retracted, then we're done, right? Uh, another way I guess I could just say is like, while any of these is true, that's probably a better way to put it, do nothing, <laughs> right? So basically what this will say is, look, see if any of the three of those is at the end of the file. If any of the three of those is at the end of the file, back the high watermark up. Then do it again, right? <clears throat> that way, we don't have to care which order the author of this HHA put those in. We can back up the watermark uh, by checking them basically uh nine times, right? Check each three, three times to see if we back up, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's it. So uh, all I have to do is just write something that does that check. So the internal uh, retract watermark function uh, there's a count, uh, there's an offset, uh, and there's a size, like so. And all we're going to do is say, all right, if the offset equals the watermark uh, minus the count times the size, right? Uh, and by the way, I guess we can allow this to be full 64-bit math if we want to, right? Um, so if the offset that you're telling me that, that this array had uh, was actually where it would be if we started at the end of the file, backed up by the size of the array, then that means this is at the end of the file. So then what we can do is say, all right, the high watermark is now back that amount, right? Or rather, I guess we could just say equals the offset. So now where that array starts is actually our new high watermark because we don't care if we obliterate it, right? Uh, and then all we have to do is just remember whether or not we did that and tell uh, the outside code, right? So that'll now find the high watermark, even if the file was written without an understanding of that. Is this uh, better there? Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> um, oops. So now all we have to do, uh, now that we actually know the high watermark, is actually implement these two functions in terms of that information, right? We know the high watermark in any file. So now in order to reserve data in the file, oh, uh, there's one other thing we actually have to do actually. Uh, yeah, just pretend I didn't say that. I'll do it now. Uh, so what we actually need to do here is we need to go through all the files uh, that are in the asset system actually. So we, you know, we, we really want to actually do this kind of a loop here. Right, we want to go through each one of these and say, look, uh, if, uh, 
If the file was modified, rewrite the directory, right? Uh, so this made changes thing actually does not need to uh, be here. Uh, it really actually wants to be up here. Uh, so when we reserve data on an asset uh, or change the data that we wrote out to an asset, when we do any of those operations, we now want the file, uh, so this stuff here, right? Uh, we want this stuff to be noting that fact. So asset file made changes or uh, modified is gonna be true uh, if either of these two things happened, right? And then here we can set it to false. In fact, this is where we should set it to false. It shouldn't be set to false here, right? <clears throat> uh, Something like that. Oops. There we go. Uh, so that's more like it. Um, almost out of time. Uh, that's a little more like it. I don't know why I call that asset file. There's really no reason for that. Okay. Uh, so now when we do reserve data, uh, we can actually do this much more, we can actually implement all of this stuff pretty straightforward now, uh, right down to the right modification to HHA. This, this will take a little more work because we have to actually rewrite those arrays, but for the most part, it's, like I said, pretty straightforward. So this function now becomes trivial. All we're gonna do is say, look, whatever the high watermark is, we just need to, that much more data, right? So the result is just whatever the high watermark is, that's where we're gonna write to, you know? Uh, and then we just advance the high watermark by that amount. Right, really, really straightforward. Then when we want to do write modifications to HHA, all we have to do is rewrite the header, right? Um, and then rewrite those uh, arrays, whichever ones we want, like the tag array, uh, tag array asset type array, um, and, the, uh, and the assets array itself. So that's really it. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think that that's all there really is to it. Um, you know, the the right this function is going to be a little annoying to write. It's but it's it's still just busy work. There's not much to it. Um, you know, you can imagine it's just going to take. Uh, It's really just going to be a thing that sums these up and then writes them out. Uh, that's that's it. I mean, there's not going to be anything magical to it. Uh, that's if we rewrite the tag array, which uh, I don't really. Th that's the part that's going to be changed. I'm not really sure how that's going to look, but you know, uh, it's pretty straightforward either way. So we'll sum up uh, those. And then we just need to take the HHA header, right? Uh, and I guess we can really just modify it in place. The magic value, the version, the tag count, um, I said the magic value and the version should be the same. Uh, the tag count will become the tag count. Um, the asset type count will become the asset count because that's the way we're going to write those out now. Uh, the asset count will also be the asset count. Uh, these offsets uh, 
uh, will be fairly straightforward. They're just like the high watermark uh, with offsets applied, right? So this is, and this is, oops. So really, really simple, right? And we know what those sizes are. Uh, we know that like, um, the tag array size is just the tag count times the size uh, of an HHA tag struct. Uh, and we know that the asset types array size is just the asset count times the size of HHA asset type. And we know also what the assets array size is because that's just the asset count times the size of the assets. It, we don't use that yet. Um, but, you know, we will. So once we have that information, we can uh, just allocate space for those and then flat write them, uh, which would probably be more efficient than issuing lots of little platform reads. So what I might say is like, pass us the temp arena uh, and let's go ahead and push arrays on there for each of these. So then we would have, uh, you know, tags, assets uh, right each of these and again it's fairly straightforward so we've got the tag count worth of those we've got the asset count worth of these two right uh, and those just go into the temp arena we then loop, so this two loops over the assets, one to count everything, and then another one here to actually fill them out. Um, and then we just write everything back to the file, right? Uh, that's very, very simple. We know what we need to write. Um, so we just say, look, here's the handle. Oops. Um, we need the offset, uh, the size, and the, inf and the information. We have all of that. So we just say the offset is whichever array this is. So, well, we want the header as well, right? So we'd say, write the header out. Uh, then write those arrays. And that'd be it. Tag array size, asset type size, type array size, and asset array size. Uh, and each of these is just the temporary buffer we used to uh, create it, right? So that's really all we need to do there. Uh, so really all we need to do is implement these two functions that gather which ones are relevant to this file because the assets are kind of scattered. We don't have them stored per file in any particular. They're, they're like a global list. Um, well, global array. So we need to actually have some method here of uh, looping through them, right? And what we're going to do is we're just going to look at each individual asset and see which file index it is. If it's the file index that we're writing, then off we go. And I guess that behooves us to uh, to write it like this. Um, because that way we can check that without having to do a subtraction to figure out which file index it is. Um, so again, pretty straightforward here. It's just like, how many assets are there? Oops. So 
So those, uh, that would give us uh, a loop over all of the assets. Uh, and then what we can do tomorrow is just do that gather, right? Um, that's supposed to be an S. These are supposed to be dots. Uh, so are these. Um, so syntax errors everywhere. Um, what is the problem? Oh, uh, yeah. There is that. Well, that's not actually how it's going to go. Anyway, um, yeah. Asset type array size. Asset types. And this is assets array. Don't ask me why I named it that. Probably should change that. All right. This can probably just go like that and off we go. So I think that's everything and that sets us up tomorrow to actually finish and start working on the tags problem. Uh, so That won't be fun because we don't really know what we want to do there exactly. But I'll go ahead and Q&A now. There we are. We've been making an editor for the engine. No, it is a generated. It's a procedurally generated game. So there isn't an editor in that sense. Did I mean to put watermark? No, I didn't. Uh, is that what I typed? Thanks. I did. I did not. Although some people do pronounce it water, like I want to get a drink of water, water. I may have missed this, but where are you handling the growth of an existing asset? Presumably, you'd still need to memcopy a huge portion of the bitmaps to insert new data or move from the middle. Uh, no, you don't really need to because, again, um, one of the things to remember is that you don't actually care during development whether you have extra bitmaps sitting around in the file, right? So let's suppose that a previous time the bitmap was 64 by 64 or something, right? And the new one's like 1024 by 1024 or something, right? Just rewrite the new one to the end of the array. If it's bigger, just write a new one and leave the old one lying around, right? When you then at the end, at the very end, when you go to ship the game, you can build a pristine one that only has the exact ones you need in there, but you don't have to care about their development. There's no reason why during development you can't just have old, old bitmaps lying around in the file that just aren't referenced. Right? Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> Cineclipe, I probably missed this, but why do we want to contiguously pack the bitmaps and the header? Um, so basically what we want to do is we want to have uh, control over our distribution file format. And so this gets into a bit of a philosophical situation that probably isn't that bad on something like Handmade Hero, but it gets bad uh, as you get bigger. I don't like load times. Uh, load times are really bad. And they're actually just still really bad even today. And so I don't want to iterate over all of like the PNG source files every time you start up the game. Like that's just inefficient. And... I want the game to start up immediately. And the only way to really do that is to have at least the metadata sitting around uh, telling you where all of the information is that you might need to grab uh, and a, having an ability to directly grab it. So in order to do that, you need to unpack sprite sheets into individual tiles and build a metadata set that can access those tiles quickly. So that is the part that I want to always be true about the game whenever it's running, not just the shipping version, but at all times. I don't really care if they're packed. Like if you wanted to do a separate kind of system that just spews files everywhere, but it actually still built that information correctly so that it was fast and has no load time, that's actually fine. I don't mind, right? I just figure why not pack them into a single file? It's just easier and then I don't have 8 billion files sitting around on my drive. You know? Is asset file actually a file? Yes, it is. It is not something we just store in memory. Um, so basically an asset file is... Uh, well, okay. It rep it is remembering the fact that there is a file. It it itself is not stored in the file. If that's what you mean. I'm not sure what you mean. But like for example, when you load the game, what happens is Handmade Hero loads all of the HHA files that it finds. So currently, it loads these five. For each one of these, it will create an asset file. So it remembers the open, and it has an open handle to it. So whenever you need a resource, it can just fire off the load immediately and grab it from there. Thanks, separate question. Again, from much earlier stuff I may have missed, what is the likelihood of a hash collision with the asset source names, and how do you handle that? Uh, well, we don't use hash disambiguation. The hash is just a way to speed up the lookup. So it's not an issue, would be the way to say it. We do a full string compare, right? I mean, is this what you're talking about? So hash collisions are not really relevant to us. Um, so. Wouldn't keeping different files for different assets and keeping another file just for the index be better for source control? Um, so it depends what you check into source control. Uh, I guess it'd be the way to say it. Um, for our purposes, we can't check in any assets to source control, so it doesn't matter. Uh, GitHub can't handle the size of the files that we would put in there. Uh, they don't let you have 
you know, 10 gigabytes of assets on the on the kind of repositories we have. I don't know if they let you do that, period, actually. They might. I don't know. Um, if you were designing this for source code control, because you actually do have source code control of your own that would actually work, um, then it depends whether you check in these dependent files or not, right? Um, the way that I would probably do it is I'd check in the source files and I'd let machines build their own uh, on the first run, probably. And the reason for that is because individual people need ability to modify the files and I don't really want them to check those in necessarily because they tend to be, you, you have to do a bunch of work to make sure that works correctly. You need to have those be tagged properly so that people don't check in things that have been processed with debug versions of a processor. And you got to make sure the names reflect what version of the code generated it and all these other things. So there's a lot more complexity that goes into an asset pipeline if you want to do the full deal. Um, but we're not really going to be doing that. Uh, what makes IOCP such a great API? How does it work better than other APIs? Uh, it works better than other APIs because it allows you to put all of your, um, so it allows you to unify all of your read and writing requests through a single message queue that multiple threads can wait on, right? Um, and it allows, it uses your pointers. Like basically it allows you to use C or C++ style um, extension, like if, you know, like let's say you got a C++ class or something. Well, okay, maybe not a C++ class because C++ is dumb. Uh, but let's say you have C and you're doing extension with C. It allows you to use your own structures as the IO structures as well. Um, and if C++ wasn't, you know, made by monkeys, it, it would have worked there too. It, it, it only doesn't work on C++ because C++ is dumb. But uh, it's just structured very well for allowing you to use it. Where it falls down is actually not anything wrong with IOCP. IOCP, I think, is pretty great uh, almost across the board as an API. Where it falls down is that Windows itself doesn't actually allow you to use IOCP for everything. So at that point, it sort of becomes not that useful for anything other than just like servers because you can't use IOCP for things like your Windows message queue um, or, uh, you know, wave, wave out completion uh, or I'm um, trying to think of some other things. Gra uh, the graphics uh, fences, right? And so what you would want to do is have all of those things go through IOCP so that basically you just have a worker thread, one per core, they all block on the IOCP. And as soon as there's something to do, it comes in on the IOCP, right? It'd be perfect. And you can do that as long as all you're doing is IO. But as soon as you add things other than IO, which games do, it all falls apart. And so the problem with IOCP is that it doesn't, it's not embraced as the operating system API. And so it's really only useful for servers as a result, which still makes it relevant to games because like your game server can still do this, um, but it makes it much less useful for game proper, like a game client, because most of the things that you actually care about can't go through IOCP. Uh, Giratoro, I was thinking on the direction of always having a running build on source control. Yeah, if you're going to always have a running build on source control that doesn't have to process assets first, because we still would, right? You'd hit run and it would have to process the PNGs, right? The first time you ran it. So it still would be a running build on source control. It just wouldn't run immediately like it would if you'd run it before. But if you actually wanted to check out and run immediately, 
you have a lot of work to do to really make a good system that works that way. I would almost argue you can't really make a system that works that way unless you write your own source code control. Current source code control just really isn't up to the task, in my opinion. When, where am I doing the witness development presentation? Uh, that is not announced yet. I've read the SQL. Quick follow-up, is that just a matter of using the one message queue for more than I.O. or when you need to use multiple message queues? Um, so the way to think about it is this. The ideal system allows you to have one thread per core waiting on a queue and the queue tells that core what the next thing is to do, right? Because then you never have unpredictability in thread switching because there are no threads to switch. IOCP does that properly when you are only doing IO because you can create an IOCP and then you can point all of your IO towards that IOCP and you're done. As soon as you have anything else you would want to do at all, anything else, it doesn't work anymore. Because even if you create other separate message queues, right? You can't wait on an IOCP and another message queue at the same time. So you, you can't even wait on two IOCPs at the same time. You can only wait on one, right? So again, it, as soon as you come out of that system and need to look at a wider system, it just all falls apart. Largely, I think, because Windows does not embrace IOCP as its method. Um, and so it makes IOCP very fragile and not very useful for other things because you can't, there is no way to work around it either, right? Like you can't, there's nothing you can do. You, you can't use IOCPs with a worker thread model if those worker threads have to do anything else because they'll never know that there's something else to do. They can only wait on the IOCP or some other semaphore. So for example, and this is nuts, wait for multiple objects doesn't work with IOCPs. Right? So again, the design of the IOCPs was good but their usefulness is severely limited because none of the other Windows APIs work with them. And so once you end up in a situation where you've got this thing that can't work with anything else, it becomes impossible to actually use IOCPs for multimedia applications because the only thing you can use IOCP for in a worker thread model system is IO. It's literally IOCPs or not, right? So uh, that's the problem. Uh, I desperately wish that the architecture of Windows had been everything goes through an IOCP. You want a Windows fence, it triggers an IOCP, right? Uh, you want to know when the sound's done playing or a buffer's underflowing on the sound, it's an IOCP when a buffer completes, right? Um, that would have been an amazing world where you know, all the birds were singing and, and the sun was shining. Uh, Windows is nowhere close to that because, because of course, we all know why, because they were too busy popping up an ad for their stupid authenticator app. Like they had resources for that. They didn't have resources to make a clean interface for their actual message model and their operating system. That's not on the table. Like that's never happening, right? But what is happening is Cortana integrated into my desktop, listening to what I say and doing stupid stuff I didn't want it to advertisements on my home screen and whatever that stupid toast was that popped up and told me to try Microsoft Authenticator. They found time for that, but time to actually make their architecture work? Sorry, 
Guess we couldn't find a meeting room for that. We were too busy having like an argument about whether Clippy should come back and dance around on top of the start menu before you could click on anything. That said, close it down thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of handmade heroes it's been a pleasure coding with you as always i think we're almost done with our journey for uh adding like kind of a new uh artist friendlier asset updating system uh to handmade hero uh we did the png reader we've done incremental update of the asset files so now really all we have to do is tackle the tags problem and i think we're good to go uh, so we'll start taking a look at that tomorrow. Hope to see you back here for that. Uh, and then we just have debugging, right? We just got to debug everything and make sure it actually works uh, well uh, because I'm sure we've got some mistakes in there somewhere. There always are. Uh, but that was pretty painless, actually. Didn't take that long to do from start to finish, honestly, uh, even including the PNG reader, which I thought was going to be worse uh, than it was. So not too bad. I'm actually pretty happy with that. Uh, not, not a huge deal. All right, uh, that's about it. If you want to follow along with Handmade Hero uh, on your own, you can always pre-order it on handmadehero.org. Uh, it comes with a source code, so you can uh, play around with it yourself. You could try your hand doing the tag system if you are interested in, in seeing if you can uh, do that before I get to it. Uh, we also have an updated website thing that you can use now if you want to. We have a, a watch page you can use to watch the stream, and it also has the episode archive on it and a bunch of buttons. Uh, you can use to uh, to jump to things like the mailing list. Uh, we have uh, the Handmade Fund also uh, has been updated now, uh, and uh, it's got a little explanation video about what it is uh, for funding community projects that uh, other folks besides me are doing. Definitely check that out if you get a chance. And of course, as always, you can click on the Handmade Hero head to get to any other of our Molly Rocket websites if you're interested in reading my tech blog or anything like that or seeing what we're up to. Um, that's an easy way to, to sort of... Uh, uh, get there from the Handmade Hero site as well. That's it for today. I'll see everyone back here tomorrow for the tag stuff. Until then, have fun programming. I'll see you on the internet.